If you were with us yesterday, you got to see an awesome presentation by our next speaker, Lawrence Brackmo, on uh, data center TCP analysis. Uh, but today he'll be talking about BPF uh, host network resource management. I finally figured out what's behind him submitting multiple talks at the conference. Regardless of whether you like BPF or not, you still get to see him make a presentation. So without further ado, Lawrence Brackmo. Thank you. Uh, Sajun mentioned that after I submitted the DCTCP talk, Alexa was very mad because the ratio of BPF and non-BPF tags had decreased, right? So then we decided to make a presentation on our work on resource management. So, so this is a collaboration with Alexa. I will do the presentation and answer the easy questions. He'll answer the hard questions. So Linux already supports allocating and managing many different resources, such as CPU and memory. Uh, network allocation is a little harder because it's not only a local resource, uh, it is also a global resource. We do not only want to manage uh, our egress bandwidth, but we may also want to manage bandwidth at different links in the network. Uh, so we re require mechanisms to manage bandwidth locally and also externally. Uh, there's already a mechanism, traffic control, that allows us to shape outgoing traffic and to poly police incoming traffic. And it has been used for also external bandwidth, you know, managing external bandwidth, like Google's uh, bandwidth enforcer. But TC has a history of performance issues, you know, like when we're using, using HTB. Uh, and there's also an issue when we're trying to enforce a bandwidth uh, to shape a, a traffic, or going traffic, where we can end up with uh, standing queues. And even though we can use Codel to try to decrease the size of the, of the queues, there's also some issues with Codel that I can talk about at the end of the talk. And more importantly, it lacks the flexibility provided by a more general mechanism like BPF. And didn't put it here, more importantly, it doesn't have a cute logo like BPF, right? And that's really, really important for me, as you can see. Uh, so the goal is to create a BPF-based framework for efficiently supporting the shaping of both egress and ingress traffic based both on local and global network allocations. Uh, the initial assumption for simplicity for us is that most of the traffic is either uh, TCP or it has similar congestion control. Although, you know, we, we also shape the other traffic, uh, especially for egress, it's really easy, you just drop it. For ingress, it's uh, something that we're planning to implement. And we also want to eliminate and reduce standing queues so that we do not increase latency. And we want the flexibility that comes for free when we use BPF. So uh, as an overview, uh, we're using the existing egress and ingress C group SKB hooks. Uh, for egress, we either use ECN marking or calls to a BPF helper, TCP enter congestion window reduction for TCP or just drop the packet. Uh, for ingress, uh, we use ECN or something similar because we need to notify the sender to slow down. Uh, as dropping packets locally, uh, it doesn't give us the bandwidth we lost. You know, the packets were already came in and we need a mechanism to make sure those packets do not come in at a rate that is not acceptable. Uh, we also have the idea of using the scopes to manage bandwidth. So and the idea is that we could have a scope for a C group so that we can enforce bandwidth for a particular C group, but also have scopes that maybe apply to a particular uh, backbone link or some you know, rack on the other side. And the idea is that each socket can belong to a couple of scopes, probably no more than four. And then we can uh, enforce the uh, bandwidth allocations based on whatever is limiting us at any particular time. So this is an example scope, but it's a bad example, sorry. Uh, rather than having two holes, it should be one host. Uh, because we're gonna have scopes that are common to two hosts right now. So imagine that there's only one host, and we have two different C groups on that host. And then like for one flow, 
we could have three scopes, the one for a C group, and then one for the backbone, and then another one for you know, uh, ingress link to a particular server. And similarly for the second one, we could have a different C group scope, but the other two scopes could be the same. Uh, so how do we do the bandwidth management? Uh, right now we're using a virtual queue to track bandwidth use per scope. And it's a very simple structure. All we need to have is to have a credit uh, for the particular bandwidth. So it's like a, kind of like a leaky bucket. And we need to have the last time when we updated the credit. So for egress, whenever we're going to send a packet, we need to update the credit based on how much time passed since we sent a packet in the past. And uh, we also need to obviously bound it. Because if we don't send a packet for a long time, we don't want to have like very large amount of credit, right? So the credit needs to be bounded. And then when we, you know, when we're going to send a packet, uh, we need to decrease the credit based on the length of the packet in bytes, but on the wire, right? So typically we deal with TSO packets. So we need to do some accounting to add the overheads for the, all the packet headers that will be used bits on the wire. You know, the extra TCP headers, one for each uh, a small packet that goes on the wire, for the IP, for the Ethernet, et cetera, to get better accounting. So the current congestion algorithm we're using to enforce the, the bandwidth, it's, you know, we use the credit. And if the credit is positive, then everything is great. You know, we can keep sending. So when the credit is negative, it means that we have used more than the allowed uh, bandwidth. But we need to be able to do that to deal with bursts, right? I mean, that's why we have queuing in general. And right now we're using, as I say, and this is done in the BPF program. This just happens to do what I'm doing right now. But the whole point of this work is we have the flexibility that people can experiment with different congestion algorithms you know, to, to, to enforce it. So in my case, I have two thresholds, a mark threshold and a drop threshold. So if the credit falls uh, in the yellow area still greater than the mark threshold, I will send it and I will not worry about it. And in between the mark and the threshold, I will mark it. And what I mean by mark depends on the type of packet that is going out. And then if we go beyond the drop threshold, we will drop the packet. Okay. In practice, I also have a small area uh, for small packets. Because I don't want to drop like SYN packets, SYNAC packets, or small control packets unnecessarily. So I allocate some amount of memory that can only be used by small packets. And it turns out that it's, uh, it's very useful. And in, in some of my experiments, it was required because when I was running multiple flows, some of the flows initially were not able to start because their control packets were being dropped, you know, for networks, for example. And uh, so it shows there some of the threshold. Ignore the bottom one, that's wrong. But so I have like 600 and 120 packet sizes for the thresholds right now. Uh, for, I think I skipped that. OK, so for marking, uh, if the packet has support CCN, I would use an ECN mark for it. Right? So for DC TCP, I can mark it. For, a TCP that is uh, non-ECN, what I will do is uh, I will call a helper function that will call the congestion window reduction for TCP, and I call it with a linear probability. So the closer I am to the drop threshold, the more likely I am to call it, right? And the idea here is like similar to red. I don't want to uh, call too many in a row because TCP is going to behave badly under those cases. And the probability I'm doing is just linear. So when the uh, credit goes to the marking threshold, I will start marking it. You know, And the closer I am to the drop threshold, the higher the probability that I will call congestion window reduction for it. And I, I think in the future, I plan to also start experimenting with different marking functions you know, that have more interesting shapes. And also change the behavior based probably on the RTT. You know, like TCP has this issue with fairness between flows with different RTTs. And one way to handle that would be for the 
marking function to take the RTT into account so that we get more fairness uh, when we're shaping the egress bandwidth. So initially, we saw some issues. Uh, the first one is that when we drop a packet in a queuing discipline, you know, in the traffic control, uh, TCP is notified that the packet was dropped, and then it will automatically call the congestion window reduction. Uh, when a packet is called with the uh, BPFC group, egress, it is, uh, TCP is not notified. So TCP doesn't know that it was dropped. And initially, the, I thought that was bad, but it was really good, because that allows us to implement our own algorithm. Right? For example, in this case, the probabilistic marking algorithm to reduce the congestion window. So it turned out to be for the better. Uh, the other thing we know, I noticed is that we were having high tail latencies in cases when we were, we were dropping a packet, but we were, there were no packets in transit. So there were no acts coming in that would trigger a retransmission of that packet. Okay. Um, so for example, if, if I was running an experiment within a rack and I had a lot of flows, let's say nine flows, the average congestion window size to fully utilize, let's say, a one gigabit limit for the C group would be one packet or a congestion window or one or less. So that, that means we would, I would need to drop packets to enforce that limit. And there would be another packet to trigger, you know, sending, resending that packet, right? Um, and normally TCP uses the probe timer to resend it, which is 200 milliseconds. So we were seeing really bad performance. So uh, the solution was to detect when we drop a packet and there are no packets in flight and reduce the probe timer to like 20 milliseconds. And I have some numbers of uh, the improvement because of that. And the other issue that I saw was that to update the credit on the last time, that's a critical section. And uh, when I started having more and more flows, uh, things started to behave really weird. Like I would put a limit of one gigabit and it would, if I had enough flows, it would go to one and a half gigabits. Uh, and the reason was that I would update the credit and then the last time would be updated by somebody else before I did it and things would look really weird. So they are, right now we don't have spin locks and BPF. And uh, so my hack was to spin lock the whole BPF program, which obviously is not ideal, but I wanted to be able to keep experimenting. The solutions that we're working on are two. One is Alexei and uh, other people in the team are working on implementing spin locks for BPF. And another solution would be to use a data structure that does not require locks. So now I'm going to talk about some of the experiments. Man, I'm talking really fast. So I'm going to be able to let you go probably sooner than expected. Uh, so the experiments right now, we're only done with one scope. Okay, so obviously I need to do play with multiple scopes, multiple RTTs, a lot more work to be done still. And for this experiment, one host sends to another host in the same rack, and we're imposing a limit typically one gigabit per second or five gigabits per second. And I'm sending uh, one, two, five, or nine flows. Uh, one of those uh, for the two, five, and nine is 10 kilobyte RPC. The other one is a one megabyte RPC. Uh, and then I limit the rate either by this uh, BPF NRM, Network uh, Resource Management, or to 3TC using uh, HTB. And in some cases, I also experimented with adding latency through NetEM, like 10 milliseconds. OK. So these results, initially, are to showcase the difference between the default probe timer and reducing it in the case where we're dropping the packet and there are no other packets in transit. Uh, so let's say. So we have one, two, and nine flows. The first two uh, columns are for cubic and they show the aggregate bandwidth for all of the flows. Uh, the first column is uh, with the large probe timer. The second one, when I reduce the probe timer to 20 milliseconds when there are no other packets in flight. So obviously, a big change is the, with one flow, we could only get half the bandwidth that we were enforcing. 
but when we reduce the, the timer, we could go up to 800 megabits per second as opposed to 500. And for two, five, and nine flows, you know, it was a little bit better. Now, notice here that in this case, I'm going beyond the one gigabit per limit enforced. And the reason is that these numbers were before I did a spin lock hack to prevent this problem, right? Uh, so if we look at the 99% latencies for the RPCs, uh, and I think this, I believe this are for the one megabyte RPCs, with the normal pro timer, the latencies are horrible. You know, like we have RTOs, or we have, well, depending on the pro timer or, the, or RTOs, they are in the above 200 milliseconds. Once we have the uh, hack or fix to reduce the pro timer, then the tail latencies for cubic decrease to more reasonable levels. Okay. Similarly, for DC TCP, uh, DC TCP is really good at fully utilizing the, the bandwidth even without the probe timer, so it's not affected as much by that. Uh, but the latencies, you know, are better, especially when we have a lot of flows uh, with the smaller probe timer. Okay. So now these are the numbers comparing uh, different uh, TCP flavors. So in, in the first case, I'm using cubic with uh, TC and HTV to impose the one gigabit per second limit, right? So I want all of the flows from this C group not to exceed one gigabit per limit, right? I'm mean, using TC. Second one, I'm using DC TCP. Ignore the ECN equal to zero, that's a bug. DC TCP uses ECN. And then I'm using cubic with and without ECN. I'm using the three bottom ones use NRM, right? And if we look at the graphs, I highlighted some interesting things. One is something that I already covered, that with one flow cubic with no ECN, is underutilizing uh, the bandwidth. We have a one gigabit limit, but it can, it's only using about 800 megabits per second. The other one, which are the, uh, uh, the circles, uh, so this graph is showing two things. One is the aggregate rate on the left axis and with the bars, and then the diamonds are showing the RTT seen by these flows, okay, the latency. And we notice that by using TC, the latencies are really large, are like six milliseconds, okay, as opposed to being microseconds for the uh, uh, NRM solution, right? So the problem with TC is that, like if I'm just using HTB by itself uh, with fair queuing, we need it, uh, it will not start shaping until it starts dropping. So it will fill the 1,000 packet queue, and then it will start, you know, like uh, dropping packets uh, for cubic. Uh, so we end up with a standing queue. Uh, we could use Codel to try to force a smaller queue. The problem with Codel is that it drops packets on egress, not ingress. So it cannot notify TCP that you drop the packet. And for TCP, this is like a a packet drop someplace in the network. So there are some issues that can occur because of that also. But we don't have this issue with NRM. You know, we don't have standing queues with NRM. Uh, we're not doing any queuing. The TC dis queuing discipline is doing some queuing, but w the way it's been implemented with algorithm, it doesn't create any, any standing queues. Uh, so this one is gonna show uh, the rates for the one kilobyte the one megabyte RPCs and then 10 kilobyte RPCs. So we're showing the rates of the one megabyte with the bars, and we're showing the rates for the uh, 10 kilobyte RPCs with the diamonds, okay? And the thing you can see, easily see, is that uh, the rates are much smaller when we use TC. And the reason, obviously, is that because we have a standing queue, uh, every RTT is going to be six milliseconds, right? So if you can only send 10 kilobytes per six milliseconds. That's the RTT. So that limits your rate. Because we don't have a standing queue, the NRM solution, whether it's cubic, DCTCP, or anything like that, can be more fair to the smaller RPC flows. You know, they, they achieve almost uh, very close to parity as, uh, as compared to the uh, one megabyte RPCs. And if there are any questions, feel free to stop me. What about the latencies? 
Uh, so one, once again, this is the one gigabit, one gigabit per second limit. We are looking at the 99.9% 99 .9 latencies on the left axis with the bars and the 50% latencies on the right axis with the diamonds, okay? And the idea here is to compare how do they look like? You know, are they the same or not? And uh, we noticed that for the one megabyte RPCs, uh, the latencies are similar for using TC and using DC TCP, whereas using cubic, uh, either with ECN or non ECN, the latencies, you know, there's a disparity in the latencies. Uh, the 50% latencies and the 99% latencies, you know, they're much larger. We're having some issues which may be uh, related to the algorithm I chose to do the marking of cubic traffic, right? I had a linear function to do the marking. Uh, I need to play with different algorithms. But this TCP does really, really well. If we now look at the 10 kilobyte RPC latencies, now the problem is TC, obviously, right? Uh, uh, let's see. So the latencies are very high as compared to DC TCP. Um, let's see. And the tail latencies also for um, for cubic NRM are still a little bit higher. Uh, so, with, you know, as I say, maybe due to the algorithm I was using, for, but for DC TCP, they look great. I mean, like the 99.9 .9 and the 50 percentile are very close together, right? So that's uh, very nice. Let's see. Okay. So conclusion for this experiment. Uh, we have similar aggregate rate for all, all the different experiments. We have high RTTs when we're using the Q in discipline, TCQ in discipline to, to enforce the one gigabit per second limit. Uh, using TC is size unfair, meaning 10 kilobyte RPCs are punished. They get up to 20 times less bandwidth than the one megabyte RPCs because of the standing queue. Uh, Cubic and cubic ECN using NRM have higher tail latencies. And DC TCP has really nice tail latencies, uh, you know, 10, 20 times smaller as compared to the other ones. So what I did now is uh, I was curious to see what would happen if I increase the, the latency to 10 milliseconds. So I used NetEM to, on the receiving side to increase the latency to 10 milliseconds. And, you know, Let's see what happened. So what happened was um, the uh, rates for TC, see, yeah, HTV with fair queuing, the, the rate for one flow was not as good as it is for DC TCP or cubic, right? Uh, the TC achieved a lower rate. The aggregate rates for nine flows are the, about the same for all of them except for HTV with fair queuing is a little bit less. Um, the one flow, one megabyte, 99% latencies are really good for DC TCP, 13 uh, milliseconds, uh, for cubic also with NRM, and they're a little bit higher for the HTV solution. Uh, however, the nine flows are better for the Queuing discipline solution as opposed to the uh, NRM solution. They're not too bad for the DC TCP, 143 versus 120 or 85. And the other ones may be also, you know, like all of these, I need to play around with the algorithm to do the marking, which thank God is BPF, so we can do whatever we want to. It is not fixed uh, in the kernel or, or an API. Okay, so what are the summary? And I think I already mentioned it. So I'm going to skip this. Uh, and then I also run with five gigabits per second uh, just to see how things look like. And, uh, you know, everybody can, has good aggregate rates, you know. And by the way, these rates that I'm showing here are the good put. 
not the actual wire rate, right? So they had to be less than the five gigabits per second because this is just the good put going through. Um, so what do you have here? Uh, so they all achieve good aggregate rates with one and nine flows. Uh, the latencies are better for HTV. Uh, they're not too bad for DC TCP. And the 10 kilobyte latencies uh, are better for DC TCP and the NRM solution. Again, because we do not have any of the standing queues. Um, but you can also see that the rate that they achieve are much higher for the NRM solution because there is no standing queue. The 10 kilobyte flows are, you know, about 200 megabits per second, whereas they're only 35 megabits per second with the HTB solution, right? Because of the standing queue. And I probably need to experiment with the Corel and see what are the trade off between dropping packets in the egress and having a smaller standing queue because of that. Okay, uh, I think I said all this. Okay, so for the egress, oh, these are not the latest slides. Remember I sent some? Okay, so I don't have the numbers here, but I'll tell you what the numbers are. I also played around with the ingress solution, right? So I used the same algorithm, you know, Alberto Q with the same markings. And what I would do is like, uh, uh, I did it for both cubic by itself and DC TCP. But obviously with cubic, uh, you need to drop. And it's a drop, so the latencies are bad. So I'm just gonna talk about the numbers for DC TCP. Uh, shaping were great. When I shaped it at one gigabit per second, uh, I got one gigabit per second. Right, uh, and the latencies look really good. I mean, there was no penalty. The difference between the 50 percentile and the 99 percentile latencies for the one megabyte and the 10 kilobytes were very close. So for shaping ingress, it worked extremely well. Um, I had an issue where I was actually dropping if, you know, like, because I just used the same algorithm. So if you got into the drop zone, I was wrapping packets. Uh, so in one of, one of the experiments with the DCTCP, uh, I had to drop and then the latencies were really bad. But as long as I was not dropping, uh, it worked really well. So it seemed like it would work really well as a solution for ingress. Uh, and I think one of the things we want to experiment also is that can we use this idea to also protect from incast in the host, right? Where we could have a scope, we have a scope per uh, per C group, we could also have a scope for the whole machine and try to enforce, let's say, nine gigabit per second limit uh, so that we can absorb burst and we can use the queuing uh, in the switch. But, you know, hopefully that, that may pro protect us against incas, especially in the, like, the multi-host environment where the, the bandwidth, the incoming bandwidth uh, to the NIC and the host bandwidth are quite different, right? From 50 gigabit per second to 12 and a half gigabit per second in some cases. Okay, my future work, play around with different marking algorithms. Ex you know, we need to use uh, the RTT for marking, for marking algorithms to get more fairness. I need to do those experiments. I also want to do experiment with testing multiple scopes, uh, concurrent flows with different RTTs, um, play with flows with different variants. Uh, and do more work with the ingress NRM. And that's it. Any questions? That was some pretty cool stuff. Uh, any questions for uh, Lawrence? Willow. Yeah, it's very interesting that you can do this experimentation. I was wondering about the, uh, the different RTTs. So yeah. the, you load the RTO to be conveniently like, not much higher than the NetM delay, right? You had a 20. I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? You had a 20 uh, millisecond uh, retransmit timeout. No, 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 no. It was the probe timer. Oh, the probe timer. Yes. The RTO stayed at 200 milliseconds. Okay. And I only do the probe timer, I decrease it only when the uh, NRM drops an egress packet and there are no packets in flight 
because then you know, I may need to depend on the product timer to resend the packet. Okay, so how closely is that related to the, um, the chosen sort of emulated RTT on your network, and how is, does that affect when you- The RTT in the network, it was within a rack, so it was about 20 microseconds. But you, I thought you had a NetM of 10 Oh No, no, that was one experiment. Oh, I'm so, sorry. But all of the others were within a rack, so the RTT was 20 microseconds. So if you look at the RTTs between using NRM and using TC, with NRM, the, the average uh, RTT, it, whether I was using one flow or nine flows, was about 100 microseconds, more or less. With, when I use TC with fair queuing uh, below it, with HTB, a one gigabit with, with uh, fair queuing, the RTT was around six milliseconds because of the queuing. So, okay, since you bring that up. Yeah. How do you get a standing queue if you have TSQ um, enabled and FQ? So if, if I was using the HTTP queue discipline and enforcing you know, the um, one gigabit per second rate, and then I have her queuing below it. So by default, what it will do is it will queue until, so it will not send packets faster than the limit you impose. So the packet that it doesn't send, it will queue. And what's your queue of a thousand packets I understand it, but okay. are these multiple flows? Because a single flow as TCP small queues yes. will not queue that much traffic to begin with, right? It will queue three packets, so you can't get the one thousand packets on one flow on HTTP. Um, I thought the limit for HTTP was a thousand. Okay, uh, I just used the default kernel, and those are the numbers I got. So did, were you using parallel flows? Because yes, yes, yes. it's these are C So I, I, I went from, I used either one flow, two, five, and nine concurrent flows. Okay. Uh, and I tried like STB with fair queuing and STB with, per, I, don't, I don't think I tried fair queuing Corel. And I think I tried just STB with, with without specifying the, the, the bottom queuing discipline. Those are the numbers I got. So I assume it was from the queuing of HTTP. So I think the main point is that maybe you should investigate sure. what happens in the single flow case, because at the socket level, you should be limited by TSQ, theoretically. Okay. Unless you change a TCP small queue parameter. Yeah. Unless you change a TCP small queue default. Uh, uh, with 10 flows, you cannot have more than 40 packets in HTB. You cannot. So, so there is something here. So remember that, let's see, 40 packets. So the rate is one gigabit per second. Yeah, it doesn't depend so forty. So one packet is, what, 10 microseconds or? No. Uh, TCB one small Q uh, yes. controls exactly the number of packets in No, 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 I understand. Post. So I'm trying to I'm understand 40 packets, what is the latency introduced by 40 packets at one gigabit per second? Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. Is, is 10 microseconds per packet at one gigabit per second? So 40 would be about 400, yeah. So uh, I'll look into it. As I said, I didn't change anything. Uh, I was running on our host that impulse something, so, mm -hmm. so maybe that was changing uh, some of the parameters. I'll look into it. Hey, Larry. Yes. I was wondering Hi. whether you did anything with multiple different types of congestion control running at the same time at all, or played around with that? No, no, no. I was limited in time. Okay. Uh, a lot of these started to come together close to this time, so I was just trying to, to run experiment. But like I mentioned, I want to run experiment with different RTTs, different congestion controls. Oh, you know. okay. Yeah. Sorry. I missed no that. Problem. Sorry about the slides, Lawrence. Oh, that's please, please. My, my fault. I waited you know, too long. Please, please submit a little bit earlier and you won't have this problem. <laughs> Maybe I did it on purpose. Sure, my fault, sure. <laughs> that's fine. Thank you very much, Lawrence. That was awesome. <laughs> Who is here for every single networking track session, both yesterday and today? Raise your hand. You guys need to seek professional. <laughs> help of some sort. No, that's awesome. That's great. Um, 
It's nice to see a lot of familiar faces. I hope everyone enjoyed themselves. Uh, it was a pretty good networking track, don't you think? Uh, that's a good response. I like that. Um, I get the sense that it was really packed densely and that some people would like a little bit of space in between. Uh, it's your fault for submitting so much good material. <laughs> so if you want more space in between talks, submit crap next time and less of it. Um, <laughs> so that was great. Um, I really appreciate everyone submitting talks and I uh, hope that everyone who, even if they didn't get accepted this time, can continue to submit because it's not because your talk was no good, it's because there was a lot of competition and uh, just please realize that when you analyze the situation. Um, it looks like uh, we had a wide breadth of work and there's a lot of cool things to hack on when we uh, head, on, head on home. Uh, after having some beers tonight. Um, I really look forward to people making progress in all the work that they're doing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a common refrain, but really, I really want BPF to be more approachable for people, more usable, easier to deploy, easier to work on. I, I use the model of, like, if people can, if fashion designers can write Arduino programs, then your average system admin should be able to write an XDP program and install it on your infrastructure. And uh, that's where we need to go, whether you like it or not. Um, yeah, so I, I really want to see more work in that direction. A reminder, I revealed the secret that some of my filters when reviewing patches get disabled, may or may not get disabled if you submit a test case or a piece of documentation, so please take advantage of that. This may be a limited time offer. <laughs> Can I make any uh, ch uh, promises about the future uh, filters that might get installed in my XDP program in my brain? Um, so that's, that's uh, about that. We, we need more documentation, particularly for driver interfaces and how to write nice drivers. Um, so that's that. Um, Moving forward, we'll do a little bit of a post-analysis of how things went. Me and Daniel will talk about it, we'll talk to the LPC committee, how everything went. Things are pretty positive, so I'm not in, uh, anticipating anything major, but we'll figure out what we're gonna do moving forward, whether we'll do LPC again, whether we'll get someone else to host us, do things on our own, whatever we wanna do, so that's the plan moving forward. Um, once again, I want to thank the LPC committee. I want to thank the uh, technical committee. And I want to thank all of you for attending and making this the event that it is. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, have a pleasant evening. <laughs>